I think we'll just dive straight yeah. in, if that's alright, Emily. That. Let's do that. Um, what uh, I'd like to, to ask is, is basically, can you give sort of an overview um, of exactly what is self-assessment and who needs to uh, who needs to file it? Well, what is self-assessment? Well, in times gone by, before I qualified, um, HMRC used to work out everybody's tax liability for them. They don't do that anymore. You have to tell HMRC now um, what your income is, what your costs are, and strictly speaking, what your tax liability is. There are those software packages that help you work that out, which now, thankfully, includes free agent. So that's what self-assessment's all about. It's all about telling HMRC what your income is, what your costs are, and how much tax you think you can expect to pay. Now, not everybody has to file a self-assessment tax return. That's how you notify HMRC, by the way. You send them a tax return, self-assessment tax return, or just a tax return for short. Um, not everybody has to do that. For example, if you earn all your money from a job and you pay tax through PAYE, so your employer will take tax off your salary before they give it to you, if that's your only source of income, you may well not be under self-assessment, so you may not have to file the tax return, so you can stop now and go and make a cup of coffee. But if you are in business in your own right, um, and particularly in this case because that's who we support if you are so a sole trader, then you can actually prepare your tax return and submit it through free agent. Now we do also provide some support for partnerships and limited companies, but it's not yet possible to submit your tax return through free agent if you have one of those businesses. Does that answer your question, Adrian? Um, just about, yes. Um, I mean, I think pretty much what we'll what we'll do with this is just sort of look at a few um, a, a, a few of the most sort of important topics that you have to do if you're so that's if you're a sort of sole trader or a limited company or, yes, or anything like that. So, uh, so, so you know, what's the uh, the most common things you have to file? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and you know, just providing a bit of a, uh, a, a go through about the, uh, yes, the whole process. Um, obviously, if uh, if anyone else is watching and uh, wants to uh, ask us a question, then please feel free to. You can either jump on and ask it to us in person, or leave a question through on the uh, on the event page, and uh, and we'll answer it for you. Yep. Uh, so please do keep them coming in because it's always so much better if uh, we've got uh, a, a live and willing audience that, uh, that's that, that's coming and asking us stuff rather than us just uh, just rambling between ourselves. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> um, I suppose um, the, one of the big things, obviously, with with self assessment coming up, um, mm -hmm. the deadline coming up on on January the thirty first. Um, There'll be a lot of people who are you know, probably <coughs> starting for uh, for the first time now. Uh, maybe left it a little bit too late, and there's yeah. only a couple of weeks left. So, in a nutshell, what do you? Uh, what are the steps you have to do to in order to get your self assessment in now? Yeah. You know, what, what should okay. you really be looking at? Great. Well, if you're new to self assessment, so you've just started a business, you've never filed a tax return before, HMRC don't know you're in business, that's HM Revenue and Customs by the way, the tax man, um, if you haven't done anything towards it then here's what you need to do. Firstly, get yourself onto the website hmrc.gov.uk and click the link in the top left that says register. That is going to be you tell your HMRC that you are in business and you've got to file a tax return. Follow the steps through that. What will then happen is two things. Firstly, HMRC will issue you with a 10-digit tax reference number, which is called a UTR. That's short for Unique Tax Reference. It's 10 numbers, 10 digits, no letters in there. Don't confuse it with your national insurance number, which is a mixture of letters and numbers. It's 10 digits. You need that in order to be able to file the tax return. The second thing HMRC will do is they will send you in the post an activation PIN number. And what that's about is making it possible for you to file your tax return online because you do have to do that now. You can file a paper form if you get it in by the end of October, but we're well past the end of October now, so it's got to be online. So that's the two things you should do. You should register and you should get your UTR and you should get your activation PIN and finish the steps. Then what you need to do is actually complete and file your tax return and you'll be pleased to know that at Free Agent we've actually got what's called a crash course, self-assessment crash course and I'm going to smile sweetly at Adrian and ask mm. him to put the link for that on our um, Google Plus page so that you can actually get to that and that will take you through in bite-sized pieces what you need to do in order to get your self-assessment tax return in. Yeah, no, we'll, uh, we'll post the links for those. Um, 
uh, immediately after this. Uh, I think the uh, the crash course is actually going live as we speak, so right. hopefully the, uh, the the link will be there. Um, I suppose a big thing as well, obviously, is is um, uh, if, if people are, are starting self assessment now, there is a chance, obviously, they, they they might miss the deadline because they might have left it a bit too late or they don't yeah. have enough time to to you know to get things done. Um, what should you do if you reckon you're in that boat? If you're going to miss okay. the deadline, what if should you, you do? Think you might miss the deadline. Well, if you can get everything done now, if you can register with HMRC now, ideally, you won't miss the deadline. Um, if you do miss the deadline, then unfortunately there is an automatic penalty of £100, which HMRC will charge if you're late with your tax return. They'll accept what they call a reasonable excuse for being late, so that might be a sudden serious illness to you or a close family member or a family bereavement or something like that. Um, but it does have to be something quite serious for HMRC to accept that, they've, that it's a reasonable excuse. And remember, ignorance of the law is no excuse. They won't accept that you didn't know you had to file a tax return. They won't accept that as a defence. So my suggestion would be get it in on, on time if you possibly, possibly can. There is also actually scope to put provisional figures on your tax return if you don't have accurate information. And if you think you'll never get accurate information, for example, if you had a flood at your office or a fire and you've lost some of your records, then what HMRC say is that you should do your best to recreate them. So perhaps if you've lost a box of receipts, you might get some inspiration by going through your credit card statements or through your bank statements or something like that. Try and find an alternative way to to work out what figures should go on your tax return. And you can put a note in the white space on your tax return to explain to HMRC that that's what you've done. OK. Um, I think we'll um, uh, look at just a, a, a couple of kind of general sort of uh, self-assessment questions. Certainly. If that's OK. Um, I suppose a big one that we, we, we hear over here is, is um, you know, people who are new to self-assessment who come and ask us uh, stuff like, you know, what's, what's payment on account? Yeah. For example, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, certainly. can you explain a little bit about that and sort of payments what you should be watching, uh, watching out for? Yeah, certainly. Well, payments on account are something that's actually very nasty. Well, I think they are anyway, and so do a lot of other accountants. Basically, if you are self-employed, so if you're a sole trader or you're in partnership, then what you can find yourself having to do is if you are due to pay more than a thousand pounds in income tax and class 4 national insurance for the tax year, you can find yourself having to make payments on account for next tax year. What does that mean? Well, let's say that you started your business during the tax year 2012-13. The tax year, by the way, always runs from the 6th of April one year to the 5th of April the following year. If you started your business in that tax year and your tax and national insurance amounts to over a thousand pounds for that tax year, what you're going to have to do is not only pay that particular tax bill by the end of January, you also have to work out that half, half of your actual tax bill for 2012-13 and you have to make a payment on, of that on account for 2013-14, the tax year we're in now. So you basically have to make a payment in advance of the tax year even finishing. So if this is the first year you're in business, you can find yourself having to pay half as much again as your actual tax and national insurance liability, which is really, really nasty. So you make one of those payments in the January, one in the July, and those count towards your tax bill for 2013-14. So let's say you're, um, you've paid £1,000 on account altogether, and then you find out that your tax bill for 2013-14 was actually 1500 HMRC, take into account £1,000 you've already paid. You then only have to pay another 500 on top of that. That's called your balancing payment. But once you've done that, of course, you've then got to think about payments on account for the following tax year. So it just all starts mounting up. So the first time you have to make payments on account, you, which is typically the first tax year that you've got a new business, or the first tax year that your tax bill goes over £1,000, you will have to pay half as much again in January as you've been expecting to. Very nasty. But unfortunately, that's the rules set down by HMRC. That's how it is. OK. Um, looking at um, income. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us examples of what kind of income uh, people might not think they need to include on the return, but they mm. actually do? That's a good question, because what you often get is people get confused. You think, well, what income do I need to include for my business? 
basically you need to think about whatever work you've done. Um, don't go by what you've invoiced, don't by, go by what you've been paid by your customers. If you do some work for a customer, let's say right at the end of the tax year, and you don't invoice them till the new tax year, strictly speaking, you should actually put that income into the previous tax year because that's when you did the work. That's one that you need to think about. Coming away from business a little bit, you need to make sure you've included income like income from bank interest, even if it's tiny, or dividend income, or um, you might, if you receive a pension, you've got to put that in. The only snag with bank interest income is that you need to leave off tax-free bank accounts like an ISA. So don't think that because you've received interest on a bank account it has to go in. Look first at what that bank account actually is. If it's an ISA or another tax-free account, you leave it off. Okay. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm a slight follow-up. For expenses, can you uh, give us some examples of some of the, the typical expenses that tend to, to trip people up when it comes to self-assessment? How long have you got, Adrian? <laughs> we're, we're here for half an hour, so literally if you want to keep going and... and, and uh, and tell people that's fine. Okay. Well, there's various issues that people do run into when it comes to claiming expenses. I'll give you some of the more common ones. Um, food and drink. If you're a sole trader, you may well think, well, can I claim the cost of food and drink when I'm out and about on business or even just when I'm working? Well, HMRC are quite strict about food and drink because everybody's got to eat in order to live. There was a case some while ago where a carpenter tried to claim the cost of larger meals than he would normally have because he said, well, look, I'm doing this hard physical work. I'm burning up more calories. I need to eat more. HMRC said, no, you can't claim the cost of that extra food. It's food. You've got to eat to live. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't have it. There's only actually three circumstances where, as a sole trader, you can claim the cost of food and drink when you're working, um, and they all relate to when you're out and about on business. You're okay if you're away from home overnight. Um, you can claim the cost of food and drink if you are staying away from home overnight on business. Second one is if your journey is outside the normal pattern of your business. So I live in Cumbria, and let's say that I've got most of my clients in Cumbria, so I would travel to visit them. But perhaps one day I go down to London for a training course. That's outside the normal pattern of my business, so I can claim the cost of food and drink when I'm on that um, journey. And the other point is that you can claim food and drink if your trade is by nature itinerant. Now, HMRC don't define exactly what that means. So there's quite a bit of debate amongst accountants about what that actually means. If you're traveling from place to place, for example, you own a children's petting zoo and you go from town to town, that's definitely itinerant. HMRC do also give the example of someone like a job in chimney sweep who will do a, um, a job with one client and then go on to do a job with another client and then another client and another client. They say, well, his trade is by nature itinerant. So you need to think about how that might apply to your own business. Discuss with your accountant if you're in doubt, but don't be surprised if you ask the same question to two different accountants and you get two different answers. The guidance is open to interpretation, unfortunately. It's not clear cut. So that's food and drink. Second one's clothing, because often you'll buy special clothes that you will only wear for your business. And you might expect you, might sh you should be able to claim tax relief on the cost of those clothes. Again, HMRC are quite strict about that, because everybody has to wear clothes to be warm and decently clad. So they have what HMRC call an intrinsic dual purpose. They'll never just be for business. They'll always be to keep you warm and decent as well. There are three situations, again, where HMRC will accept that clothes are just for business. One is if it's a uniform. So, for example, if you are a self-employed nurse and you have a nurse's uniform, they're happy to accept the cost of your uniform to claim tax relief on, but only your uniform. You wouldn't be able to claim, for example, the cost of your shoes and stockings that you wear with your nurse's uniform. Second one is protective clothing. So if you are, for example, a tree surgeon or you're a builder, and you need to wear protective clothing. So that might be a jacket, it might be sight boots, it might be a high-vise vest, something like that. You can claim that as protective clothing. But again, remember, it's only the protective clothing that you can claim. So if you wear, for example, a protective jacket over a normal everyday shirt and jeans and sight boots, 
the only costs you could include there would be your jacket and your boots, not your shirt and jeans, because they're part of what HMRC would call your everyday wardrobe. The third point is if you are an actor or an entertainer, some in that kind of profession, and you wear a costume. So that might be if you're a children's entertainer and you wear a clown outfit, or you're a children's magician and you wear a suit and a top hat, then you can claim the cost of your costume. So that's food and drink and clothing. The third one that quite often gets asked about is business use of home. So if you work at home. If you're self-employed, so you're a sole trader or in partnership, and you work from home, then you will be able to claim part of the running costs of your home in your business accounts. So how does that work? Well, there are some new simplified rules, but they only kicked in from the 6th of April 2013, so they're not applicable for the tax year that we're about to file for. What you have to do is you have to work out a reasonable proportion, apportionment, for how much you used your home for business. Typically, that would be that you work out how many rooms you use for business in your home out of how many rooms you actually have in your home, and then to work out how much you use that room or those rooms for business. Now, it's never a good idea to say a room is 100% for business use. If you own your home and you say a room is 100% for business use, if and when you come to sell your home, HMRC will sting you for capital gains tax on, on that room. So make sure it is partly for business and partly for private. My own home office also has a piano in the corner because it doubles as my music room. So if HMRC ever said, I think you are just using that room for business, I would be able to say, see a piano. I'm not a musician. I'm an accountant. Therefore, I do not use this room just for business. So make sure that you have a visible, ideally, means of proving to HMRC that you do use that room for private as well as business purposes. So coming back to it, so you've worked out the reasonable proportion. What expenses can you apply it to? Um, well, one is your rent, if you rent your home, the interest on your mortgage, if you're buying your home, just the interest, not the capital payments, your council tax, those your, your light, your heat and power, those you would all apply the business proportion to. So let's say that in a year you've spent a thousand pounds renting your home and you've got a you've got one room out of ten that you use for business and you use it eighty percent for business use. So what you would do is you take that thousand pounds, you divide it by ten, you multiply it by eighty percent. And for goodness sake, don't ask me to do that calculation <laughs> line because my mental arithmetic is hopeless. <laughs> but that's that's how that works. So those are some of the costs you can apply it to. Some others. Telephone and broadband, what you need to do is actually get hold of an itemized bill and work out how much you actually used your phone and broadband for business. Insurance, depends on what you are actually insuring. If you've bought home insurance that also covers your business, and check your policy by the way and make sure it covers a home business, not all of them do. If you've got just one policy that covers home and business, again you apply the business proportion like you would for rent or council tax. If you've got an insurance policy that is specifically for your business, you claim the full cost. If you've got home insurance that does not cover your business, you can't claim any of it. No, nothing at all. Nothing at all. If you've got home insurance that doesn't cover your business, I would say you can't claim any of it. Okay. Yep. Repairs and cleaning both work the same way. If you have a um, repair done to the whole house, like a roof repair, you claim the business proportion. If you have a cleaner cleans your whole house, you claim the business proportion. And that's using the same method as That's before. exactly right. That's right, okay. Adrian. Yep. Um, if, you're, if the repair or the cleaning is just done to the room you use for business, you start with that, and then you apply the percentage of how much you use that room. So in my example, that's 80%. But if your repair or cleaning does not use your business room, so for example, you have your living room painted and you don't use that room for business, that cost's got to be left out. Another cost you can't claim is water. Or, um, any proportion of your water rates if you work at home. Unless you have a separate line, a separate water pipe rather, that's used just for business. So for example, if you run a dog grooming parlour and you have a separate water pipe for the extra water you need and it's charged to you separately, then you can claim the cost of that. Otherwise, water, no go at all. Not even if you make a lot of cups of tea. Not even if you make a lot of cups of tea. Remember, uh, we've all got to eat and drink to live. <laughs> nice try, Adrian. Excellent. Um, so is that pretty much everything for, for, for that, business use of home? That's, yes, mm -hmm. that's pretty much everything for business use of home. Mm -hmm. um, the other 
expense you need to watch out for is travel expenses. So you do if you do travel on business, which a lot of people do, make sure that your journey is actually for business purposes. HMRC are quite strict about what does and doesn't constitute a business journey. If you're going to visit a client site and you go regularly to that client, HMRC actually say that for the self-employed, if you go there on a regular basis for more than six months, that can't counts as commuting that you can't claim. They're actually quite nasty about that. Employees get two years, self-employed, six months. Yeah, so watch out that your journey does actually count as business with the revenue. Okay. Um, and I take it that there's, that they're fairly strict on um, if, if you use your, uh, if your journey is for both business and also oh, for, for exactly, personal Adrian. use as well. Oh, exactly, Yes, they are. They are. So if, for example, you go and visit a client and you also pick your child up from school on the same run, then HMRC would be likely to say, well, you'd have had to do that journey anyway for the school run, and they wouldn't let you claim it. Um, make sure if you do do a mixed journey that you can actually distinguish between which bits for business and which bits for private because you can claim the business element. So that's quite useful if you're doing, for example, a journey that means you have to stay away from home overnight. So, for example, let's say I go to London and I do a training course and I decide to spend an extra night in London to go and see a show. I can't claim that cost for hotel accommodation, which by the way works the same way as travel does. I can claim the costs of any nights I spent in a hotel for the training course. Okay, um, that's actually sort of touching on the next bit I wanted to, right, to, to look at, which was uh, about sort of entertaining. Yes. Um, so you know, client meetings, that kind of thing, taking yes. people out for, um, mm. for for lunches. Now I know that this is a uh, you know, we've we've chatted about this before, and it's yeah, uh, it's, it's it's uh, quite a grey area too. Yes. So um, if you can just give us a couple of pointers of, of, of sort of what um, you know what's allowable, what is, and what the yeah. what the main things that people kind of get uh, tripped up on when it comes to this. Well, again, this is a point where HMRC are quite strict because. Because tax relief on business entertaining, uh, 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 you can't have it. So if basically you take out for lunch or you take out to the theatre or you buy a coffee, anything like that for somebody who is not a bona fide employee of your business, HMRC actually say you can't have tax relief on it. Strictly speaking, they would also say that if you were like a group of freelancers working together and you took turns to buy each other coffee and cakes, they would probably say that was business entertaining. So they are, they are quite nasty about it. I had one case where I had a client, it was a limited company actually, but um, he, his wife, the, the sole director's wife did quite a lot of work, unpaid work for him. She would open his post, she would answer the phone, um, she was unpaid, but every Christmas he would take her out for a meal to thank her for that work. HMRC said, that's not because she's doing work for your business, she's not an employee, she's not on the payroll, you're taking her out because she's your wife, no tax relief. Nasty, nasty. Mm. Um, what, I'm, uh, what I'm going to do now is, is we actually um, uh, had a couple of questions through uh, this morning when we, right. um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we did a, a live Q&A here on, uh, on, on Google Plus as well. So I'm just going to post a couple of these now. The, cool. Some of them do have some crossover with what we've been talking yeah. now, but they're actually sort of more specific um, yes. examples and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I'll just rattle a few of these right. um, through to you and, uh, and we'll go through if that's okay. Uh, first one was, um, does income go in when I invoice it or when my customers pay it? Yeah, well we've talked about this briefly mm -hmm. before. It's um, Strictly speaking, the answer is it's neither because, it's, uh, because you need to think about when you actually do the work. So as I said earlier, if you invoice before, uh, sorry, if you do the work before the end of the tax year, you've got to include that income in this tax year, not next tax year, even if you invoice later. Okay, um, and uh, next question was, I've heard something about being able to do accounts using simplified method. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it's not going to apply for this year, unfortunately, because that kicked in on the 6th of April 2013, which means it relates to the tax year that's still ongoing. You can't use it for the tax year 2012-13. But what it is, is that sole traders or partnerships whose partners are all individuals, so no partnerships with a company for a partner, um, they, if their turnover is under £79,000, the VAT threshold, will be able to prepare accounts for their tax return on a cash basis. So instead of thinking about when you did the work and when you accrued the cost, you think about when did customers um, pay me and when did I pay my suppliers, which should actually be a lot, lot easier to keep track of and it means you don't have to have accounting in your head. You don't have to think about accruing for costs or accruing for income. 
Um, it also uses simplified rules for certain expenses that you can use. And one example of that is business use of home. So for example, if you work at home, from the 6th of April 2013, you can actually use a flat rate allowance to replace some of the business use of home calculations. And that allowance depends on how much per month you work at home. But what you've got to remember, though, is that that allowance doesn't cover all the costs. It covers heat, light, power, telephone, and broadband. Not your rent, not your council tax, not your mortgage interest. You've still got to do the business use of home calculation for those. So watch out for that. This is, um, this, is, this is going to be me on my hobby horse, but a lot in a lot of cases, rules that are designed to make life simpler for business owners often actually make it harder. So don't get caught out by that. But that's a little bit about simplified accounting for next year. OK. Um, I would do this one as well, which is, um, uh, if I buy an asset for my business before I start trading, do I still get tax relief on it? You do. You do indeed. And that, um, tax relief for when you buy a piece of equipment, um, that might be called fixed asset or a capital asset in accountant ease. What that basically means is it's a piece of equipment, a bit out, bit out of the way for you to make that purchase. It's not the sort of run-of-the-mill thing you buy every day. So something like if you buy a new computer or you buy a chair or something like that, um, if you buy um, that's going to be useful for more than a year or two. If you buy a large asset like that, then instead of putting it in as day-to-day -day running costs and reducing your profit that you pay tax on that way, what you do is you get what's called capital allowances on that asset. The good news is, if you buy the asset before your business began to trade, assuming that you're just going to use it for your business, then you can still get capital allowances on it as if you had bought it after you began to trade. You do have to be a little bit careful, though, if you've got an asset that you've previously used for something else. Because if you've got an asset that you've previously used for something else, your capital allowances are going to be restricted. Also, capital allowances are restricted for a car. HMRC do not give full capital allowances on a car. So you need to check with your accountant and check the rules, because capital allowances are complicated. OK. Um, yeah, I'll do this one as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not too sure how easy this will be, but uh, <laughs> um, how can I tell if I've got to make payments on account in the next tax year? Right, OK. Well, we were discussing payments on account a, li a little mm -hmm. bit earlier. Um, you will have to make payments on account if your income tax and Class 4 national insurance bill for this year are over £1,000. And if, um, so, so long as you haven't had more than 80% of your tax already deducted at source. So what that might be is if you've got a highly paid job, and you're also running a business on the side because for your job you will pardon me you will have had tax deducted at source through PAYE. Your employer takes your tax off before they give you the salary. You don't get the total salary and then hand some over to HMRC. That's what it means by tax deducted at source. So payments on account are if your tax liability and class four national insurance liability together amount to over a thousand pounds and you haven't had eighty percent deducted at source. Adrian, can I just actually explain what I keep saying about Class 4 National Insurance? Yeah, yeah please right? do, please do. Yeah, because when you're a sole trader, there's three um, taxes that you're, you might well be subject to, at least. National Insurance, strictly speaking, isn't a tax, but it feels so like one that everybody thinks of it as a tax. When you're a sole trader, you will pay on your profits two different kinds. You pay income tax on your profits, and you pay what's called Class 4 National Insurance. Um, you also have national insurance called Class 2, and that's a flat rate weekly sum. And when you're self-employed, that is what entitles you to state pension, is paying that Class 2 national insurance. Class 4 national insurance and income tax only kick in when your profit reaches a certain level, and that level will change every year. It'll go up a little bit every year. Class 2, the threshold for Class 2 is quite a bit lower. It's only something like profits of 5725 for the current tax year. But for class two, the exemption's not automatic. You actually have to apply for it. The reason for that is that if you don't pay class two, even if you are exempt from paying class two because your profits are low enough, if you don't pay it, it could well affect your entitlement to state pension. So it's a good idea to actually just make sure that you're, um, 
um, that you are, if you decide to apply for the exemption from class two, that you your entitlement to state pension is not affected. So do talk to your accountant. But as I say, on your profit, you would pay income tax and you would pay class four national insurance, and class four doesn't affect your pension. Okay, um, I think I'm going to do two more questions, if that's okay. Um, they're more for um, people who uh, need to work out whether they actually have to do self Okay, now. yes, that's um, me. Uh, first one is, if I haven't actually sold anything yet, Yes. am I actually trading and do I have to file? Okay, well if you haven't actually sold anything yet, then quite possibly the intent is there that you begin to trade. It may be that for pragmatism, I saw some accountants discussing this the other day, you decide to actually just keep track of all your costs because you can still claim tax relief on them and only do a tax return once you actually start to make some sales. Um, but HMRC have what they call a list of badges of trade which they use to identify whether somebody actually is trading and therefore should be paying income tax and class 4 national insurance or whether they're just occasionally perhaps selling off some old clothes or old CDs on eBay because that's not a trade strictly speaking. So they've got a series of badges of trade. We have got a link on our blog that talks about that. Um, they're things like do you intend to make a profit? How did you acquire the, um, the goods that you're selling? That kind of thing. So as I say, that's, that's on our blog. And uh, mm -hmm. if I smile very sweetly at Adrian, I'm sure he will post that link up for you. Certainly will, certainly Thank will. You. Um, <laughs> and uh, the final question I was going to say was, um, if I, I haven't sold anything like £5,000 worth, so do HMRC still need to know about my business? And do I still have to pay tax? Yes, HMRC still need to know about your business. If you're trading, you must tell them so. But as I was mentioning earlier, the limits for when you might have to pay tax, um, 5,000, and remember it's profits of 5,000 you'd pay tax on, not sales of 5,000. If your sales are 5,000, your profits aren't going to be as high as that. Mm -hmm. The limit for class two national insurance, which is the lowest limit, is 5,700. So you may well not have any tax to pay. But for income tax and class 4 national insurance, it does depend on whether you have any other income, such as income from a job. Because if you've got income from a job, that will probably have mopped up the personal allowance for you, for you, for that you're allowed not to pay tax on already. So you might your income tax might kick in sooner. But conversely, there is, um, there is, there is a deferment you can take if you're due to pay national insurance on both employed and self-employed income. So conversely, it might actually postpone your liability for class four. So if in doubt, talk to your accountant. Mm, I was going to say, actually, do you have to tell HMRC about every bit of income that, uh, that comes into your business? Yes, you do. <laughs> if it's business income, you've got to tell them. I see. Uh, it's no yeah. Um and I suppose, okay, um, we'll keep going for a couple more minutes um, just with a, with a few very, very final questions. Um, the first one, which I don't think we've actually mentioned so far in this, in this session, uh, what date does the, the self-assessment tax return cover? Good question, Adrian, good question. Well, the, the tax year in the UK runs from the 6th of April one year to the 5th of April the following year. Mm -hmm. Now, why on earth is it such a peculiar day? Well, because the church calendar always used to start on the 25th of March, Lady Day, the Annunciation of the Birth of Jesus. Um, and way back when, in I think 1750 something, um, the UK decided to start using the um, Gregorian calendar instead of the Julian calendar, which meant chopping 11 days out of one year in order to in order to let them catch up. So, um, and while the calendar year was changed at the same time from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, the tax year wasn't. So that's why we have a tax year with such a funny end. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a, a very sort of archaic, oh, old, yes, old-fashioned reason for is, it, right? It certainly is. Um, but what happens is, if you're a sole trader, then the easiest date to prepare accounts to is the 5th of April every year for your business because then your year end matches the tax year end. HMRC also say that if you have a year end date that's close to the tax year, typically 31st of March, that also counts as matching the tax year. If your year end doesn't match the tax year, so if as a sole trader you like to do your accounts for a calendar year instead, what will happen is in, say, 2012-13, for 2012-13, you get taxed on the profits for your accounting year that finishes in the tax year. So 2012-13, 6th of April 2012 to the 5th of April 2013, the calendar year that finishes in that period is 2012. You get taxed in the, on the profits for your calendar year 2012. Special rules apply, though, if your business has just started, changed its year end, or is finishing, 
And sometimes in the early years of your business, you can pay tax twice on the same profits. Nasty, nasty. Check with your accountant. Okay. Um, and um, forgive me, I can't remember if we actually touched on this at the very, very, very start. Um, but how do you actually file your tax return as well? What yeah. are the options that are available to you in Great. order to, to, to file it by the deadline? Yeah, okay. So you have to file your tax return by the 31st of January. It now has to be done online because we've passed the 31st of October. What options have you got? Well, you can either, of course, use free agent if you are a sole trader because mm -hmm. we've just released that functionality just lately. Yeah. Um, Again, we'll put the link to that on the on the event page. But uh, great. yeah, it's 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 very good. We've had a lot of very very positive feedback yes, about. Yes, we uh, have. We uh, have had a great this. deal of positive feedback. But if for whatever reason you can't use free agent, for example, you're in partnership or you're the director of a limited company and you can't file your self-assessment tax return through free agent yet, HMRC have a free filing tool you can use or you can use another commercial package, something like TaxCalc, which will help you work out your tax. Excellent. Um, and yeah, all of this should be relatively easy to to understand. <laughs> you hope so, you hope so, but unfortunately... It is with free agents, so It anyway. is with free agents. We do our best to make it as easy as we possibly can, but if, if you're in any doubt at all, do speak to your accountant, because whoever said tax doesn't have to be taxing was telling a big fat lie. <laughs> um, well, okay, I think that's going to be it for today. Um, really hope that everything has been, uh, all the stuff that we're talking about has been really useful, really helpful. Um, we will hopefully be doing another one of these quite soon, so um, uh, keep an eye out on our Google Plus page uh, for more details on that, and we'll uh, we'll let you know when that's going to be. Um, we also run these Q and A sessions every um, well, it's every Wednesday and every Sunday January. in January, all purely about self assessment. So the Wednesday ones are always at ten o'clock in the morning uh, GMT, and the Sunday ones are usually at two. I think that's between right, two yeah, and two three. Um, so an hour long session on a Sunday. Uh, so if you've got any uh, any queries this week or something that you think about that uh, you know mm -hmm. you, you didn't get to ask or, or you really wish you had, then um, uh, just come back and uh, you can ask them to us uh, uh, again on those days. Uh, again, check the the Google Plus and also our Facebook pages, uh, and we'll give you the um, the links and the times and everything else. Um, as we said earlier as well, we do have a crash guide um, to self-assessment, which we've just launched today. Uh, we'll post the links to that up on uh, up on the event page as well. Um, but essentially, what it is, it's a uh, you know, as we were talking about before. If you're coming, if you're coming into uh, to, to, to self-assessment just now, maybe you've left it a little bit late. Maybe it's uh, it's something that slipped your mind until now, and you're really kind of um, you know, getting a bit edgy about how you're going to do it. Then essentially, the uh, the, the crash course is, is is kind of a step by step. Um, guide for you through how you how to start, how, what you have to do, and uh, how you can get it in uh, and file it in through to Agile and see it on time. So, uh, so, so, so do check that out. I um, we'll hope that would be really useful yep. for uh, for a lot of people too. And also, we'll post some links through to our our website as well. We've got a lot of other uh, self assessment information over there. Um, it's quite a lot of sort of checklists, um, infographics, and, um, and 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 some sort of white papers as well, all about different aspects of, uh, of self. -assessment and what you can yeah. claim, what you can't. So uh, we'll post the links to those and hopefully they'll be really useful to you as well. Um, but uh, yeah, for today, thank you very much indeed, Emily. Really appreciate it as always. Um, hope it's been helpful for you guys and we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.